Good morning and welcome. Thanks for joining us uh, for the Creating Your Professional Website workshop with uh, Chelsea Juliet Rowell. Chelsea is the head of digital scholarship at the Tisch Library, and we are really happy that you are able to join us. So we'll try to keep on time and I'll hand it over to Chelsea. Thanks so much, Angela. And thank you everyone for being here on the last week of classes. Um, this web of this workshop was originally scheduled, I think the week before Thanksgiving and I got sick, but I was hopeful that this time would be, would work for folks because I think intercession is the ideal time to uh, fool around with one's own website. It's exactly how I did it as a graduate student. So hopefully you'll leave today feeling empowered to create the kind of web presence that, that you want. So I divided our time together into four pieces today. The first is analyzing existing websites um, from people with scholarly and creative pursuits. So getting some inspiration. The second part of our time together is thinking intentionally about planning your website content and deciding what, um, what types of content you want to include. The third component is instead of focusing on content, focusing on planning the website design. So the look and feel um, of your website. And finally, the fourth component is a little bit of time to reflect and to make your own plan for how you want to move forward either during um, the oodles of time we all have during intercession, I say only half seriously. Um, or later on in your career. So we have about 10 people with us today. And I think that I have planned the contents so that it's not bursting at the seams, meaning that there is some space if you want to ask questions as you go. So please feel welcome to do that. You can do so either by adding your question to the chat and Angela is kindly monitoring the chat so that um, you know she can bring it to my attention or you can also feel welcome to unmute yourself and speak up. So with that, I will continue. So if you want to take a moment and open or follow the short link that's displayed here on my slide. It is tiny.cc slash GSAS website with GSAS all caps. Um, you'll find when you follow that link, you should find just sort of like a plain text kind of Google Doc that has a couple of example websites. Um, I'll queue you up when when it's ready to move over to that to that um, to that document, but I wanted to give you a moment to pull it up now. So if you follow the link successfully, you should see something like this and let me know if you don't. Okay, so I want us to start by looking at other websites and seeing what works about them and what doesn't work about them or what might work for you and what might not work for you. Um, I am feeling brave and so I decided that I would start by showing you my professional website, which is, um, I would characterize it as basically my site is a CV site, right? And the, the audience that I imagine for my site is I'm applying for a new job and the search committee is going to search my name on the web and I want my personal website to be the first thing that they find so that I'm sort of in control of the narrative. Um, and I guess the other audience or scenario I imagine, right, I'm a librarian, library Twitter is fairly active. So 
I can imagine scenarios where someone interacts with me on Twitter for the first time and they're like, who is this person? And again, they like clink, click on the URL in my Twitter bio or just Google me and this is what they find. So my website has a pretty simple rhetorical function. It's just, I want to provide the first bio or sort of professional philosophy that people see. Um, the components of my website are pretty simple too, right? I have a headshot, I have my name, I have a, a slogan as it were, which is actually an excerpt from Lincoln's second inaugural speech, which was a helpful part of personal branding when I was a history librarian and the history faculty who were evalu evaluating my candidacy, um, you know, appreciated that. I have social media slash contact icons to Twitter, Instagram, email, GitHub, Goodreads just for fun, and Pinboard, which is like basically what I'm reading lately. And the central focus of my, the homepage of my personal website is um, something like a block of text that is somewhere between a bio and a professional mission statement. And it's something that I've tinkered with over many years um, and is always sort of, yeah, it undergoes continuous revision as my professional identity undergoes revision. You can find, should you wish to poke around more, you can find my website at a rarebit.com, which is also kind of related to personal branding in a way. Number one, because I like cheesy foods like Welsh rabbit. And number two, it was a bit of like a library joke. So when I was in grad school, I thought that I would go more into uh, digital preservation, which is an area of specialization within librarianship. And so preserving rare and unique digital materials. And the joke is that there's no such thing as a rare bit as in like a one or a zero, all ones are equal to other ones and all zeros are equal to other zeros, but it's the, you know, the unique combination of those ones and zeros. Um, but I went all in and that's my Twitter handle and it's my website URL. And even though that's not my area of specialization, it still delights me. And so I've stuck with it. Okay, so obviously my website is only one example. It is not necessarily the, the um, a paragon for every individual to follow. So what I want to do is offer y'all time to look at a couple of different websites, or rather I'll divide you into small groups and you will look at a particular website. And as you look at that website, I want you to ask yourselves and discuss within your group a couple of guiding questions. First of all, who is the intended audience and what are they trying to accomplish? What are their needs or desires? So I know if you're thinking about making a website, you're probably thinking about marketing yourself, you're thinking about, but I want you to flip it, right? And start with the audience, the people who are going to encounter this website and what are their needs? So you can keep those needs in mind in order to meet them. Okay. Another question for you to consider. What elements does the design of the website emphasize? For example, logo, text, image, menus. So literally what are the components of the website and which ones draw your eye? Um, another question, notice the organization of elements on the page. What comes first? What comes last? How does that order assist in communicating the context and purpose of the site? 
So here you might be thinking about the, the menus, the navigation, um, and the kind of choices that those menus and navigation represent. How are contact, contrast and color used on the page? Do they emphasize certain elements or help the designer to reach a certain audience? And finally, a sort of um, meta question, what story does the website creator tell about themselves? What information do they share? What information do they omit? Okay, so here I want to pause. And before we break into small groups, I want to invite questions about these questions. <laughs> do they make sense? Um, would you like clarification or further discussion so that we can reach a shared understanding um, before we break into small groups? Quick question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that one of the benefits of a website, having your website is that it can be the first thing that people yeah. get to when they Google you. Um, how do you ensure that it's the top result and not buried after, you know, a Facebook mm -hmm. post you made 10 years ago or something? <laughs> or is that That's possible? Like, uh, it is totally possible. I think it's like kind of a complicated question and it depends on like your existing, it depends on some things that are within your control and some things that are outside of your control. So I have, the um the privilege of having a fairly unique name like there are lots of chelsea's but there are very few chelsea's that spell their name the way mine is spelled and they're none in combination with chelsea rowell so as soon as you're searching me you're you're searching me now you might be digging up like old content that i have no interest in being the first result but at least you're finding me you know, it might be harder with a name like, um, you know, Kim Park or something like that. Um, there are some things though that like, so my, it depends on the search engine you use, but my personal website does always come up either like one, two or three in the search rankings. Part of that is because I um, I remember maybe about like three years ago, I was like, why is my website on the lower end of the first page results? And it was because I had not updated my website so that it had HTTPS. So I don't know if you've ever looked in a browser and you see like in the top left, a tiny, tiny icon for a lock that's closed. Um, and that it plays into search algorithm rankings. Like if you are using a secure HTTPS connection as opposed to an unsecured HTTP connection, um, when you use the secure connection, you appear higher in the rankings. And as soon as I fixed that, I fixed my site appearing first. Um, but it had like, there are lots of things that it has to do with frequency of updates, how many things are linked to that page. Um, and if that is something that you're trying to accomplish, we can definitely have like a one-on-one -on -one consultation about that because I do think it like, it depends on a number of factors and we can talk them through. But thanks for that question, Alec. Thank you. Any other questions before we divide into small groups? Either about the discussion questions I've provided for you or, or anything else that we've talked about so far. Chelsea, um, I put the um, abbreviated questions in the chat too, if that's easier for people to access when they're in their breakout groups. That's awesome. Thank you, Angela. Okay, so 
at this point, you should have this, um, this text document open. I've put the questions here, and then there are four example websites. So when you when I divide you, I'll divide you into four breakout rooms and the number of your breakout room will correspond to the number of the example that your group is tasked with looking at. So if you find yourself in breakout group number one, you'll be looking at Thomas Padilla's website. If you find yourself in breakout room three, you'll be looking at Jessica Marie Johnson's website. Um, so give me just a moment to get the breakout rooms going. Hi everyone, welcome back. We will just wait for um, wait for the waiting rooms to close fully before we continue. Okay, I think we have everyone back. Um, so thank you all for taking a look at, you know, a close look at someone else's website. And thank you too for sharing your observations here in the, in the text document. So um, I thought maybe since people didn't get a chance to, see, you know, people only got a chance to see one website that we might do a really quick round and um, show the other website. So I wonder if someone from group one could give like a 30 second sort of takeaway about Thomas Padilla's website. And if not, I'm happy to speak for you since I have your text on the document. Um, yeah, so we basically were um, like his intended audience really looked like it was focused on academia. It really emphasized like his qualifications, like professional organizations and like conferences and talks that he went to. So we were like, okay, he really wants to convey to people in academia what he has done and a willingness to collaborate because he says he wants to consult. Um, we recognize that his like website really emphasized text. There wasn't really a lot of like pictures except for the little <laughs> glasses thing at the beginning. I mean, at the top bar or whatever. Yeah. Um, however, in the text, he did use color. Like we did like the usage of like black and orange because the orange kind of showed the hyperlinks in the other clickable material, which differentiates it from the rest of the text. So if you don't want to read all the text, you can just go to what's important and it's like highlighted and visual. And as far as the story it tells, we felt like it was just kind of like a story of his like professional like development, his like projects, his like, you know, interest and also the like places he's like shown and demonstrated his expertise. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Natalie. Um, would someone from group two like to speak briefly about Kim Ferrero Arneas's website? Hi. Um, yes. Yeah, so Kim's website, Kim was a filmmaker um, and we made comments that really the biggest thing that stuck on her website is the giant eye that shows up <laughs> when you first open it up. Um, so kind of her story, it seems like her work is influenced by the human body, um, part, 
So the eye kind of contributes to that. And then the color scheme we thought resembled like different shades of human skin tones. Um, and we had some trouble figuring out the point of the website. It kind of seemed like it was to increase her exposure and just kind of showcase her work. Um, but something that was interesting was that there was no real way to connect to her. She didn't leave any contact information mm. or social media links. Um, so that left us feeling a little confused about the overall purpose of the website, I guess. <laughs> I think that's a really good point. Like what, what, yeah, it's going back to that first question of like, what are the needs or desires of the viewers? It's like, if their need or desires to get in touch, they definitely cannot accomplish that goal. Um, okay, cool. Group three, Jessica Marie Johnson, who is sort of scholar, public humanist activist, I can talk uh, about what we discussed. Uh, we started off with the intended audience. Uh, it seemed like she was targeting a pretty wide audience because her interests are pretty diverse. Um, it's all kind of concentrated around critical race theory and the like, but it seemed that she wanted to target publishers, people who are reading her books, but also really anyone in the public who would be interested in her activism. Uh, we definitely took note of the digital elements that she incorporated into her website. It's really not text heavy, at least like when you're surfing through the different parts, but it's not text heavy. Um, and it's mainly like di different forms of media that are related to her research. Uh, we noticed that she has a lot of menu options, which shows mm -hmm. how like eclectic, I guess, her research is. Um, but we like wondered whether maybe it was a little bit um, like a few too many options. Mm -hmm. um, when we were looking at organization, um, we were th thinking about whether the phrasing of public scholarship might be, be a little bit redundant, but, um, and also realized that it's a little bit hard to navigate uh, once you're within the website because it doesn't have a clear tracker of where you are within her like information architecture. Yeah. Um, and then story-wise, I mean, she tells her brand pretty well. It's very multifaceted. Mm -hmm. She knows her like identity within her work well. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was our, that's what we were taking from it. Cool, thank you. Okay, fourth and last group, Aaron McGee. I guess I can go. Um, I think our overarching takeaway from this website is that we weren't quite sure what the, the primary purpose of the website was. Um, mm -hmm. So she has this hashtag find that lizard campaign, which she so that's the only menu item that has a drop down. So it has sort yeah. of the most content in a way, and she has merch for it. Um, so, and she also mentioned down there that she has a Patreon. And if you go to her LinkedIn, it's the first thing that she mentions. So clearly yeah. this is super important to her. But if you go to the website, the splash page is about her and it mentions the campaign, but it's more about sort of giving details on her work. Um, mm -hmm. So, if, if the goal of the website is to promote the campaign, it seems at least to us that maybe that should be the thing that you land on when you go to the website. Yeah. Um, and we generally like the look of it, you know, the the nice contrast of the, the purple and the white and the pictures are really nice. Um, although the, the this big one is a bit blurry. Um, mm. But it yeah, I think just the takeaway was what is the, the primary purpose of the website supposed to be? Yeah. Yeah, and I think going back to that very first question, which a lot of y'all have sort of focused on is like, what does the person coming to this website need to accomplish, right? Um, and I think the answer for some of these websites, as cool as I think they all are, um, that question is maybe a little bit blurry. Okay, so let's return. So we talked about 
that that comprises part one, uh, analyzing other websites and sort of seeking inspiration. So I want to talk a little bit about planning the website content, which I think is very much tied to um, both the first and the last questions and the guiding questions that I posed. So from your viewers and what is the person coming to your website trying to accomplish? And I think it's really important to start with that in mind. And then um, with that in mind, to ask yourself the question of what story you want to tell and what you want to include and what you want to omit. How much is personal and professional blended? How like rigidly separate are there? Are they? Um, and I have a couple of, I don't know, a couple of frameworks to help you think about um, designing that content. So let me take a look at the time. Okay. I think we won't do this activity live, but I really encourage you to do it yourself. Um, so starting with that question of audience, who is your audience? And um, I would invite you to think about this question in two steps. One, list every conceivable type of viewer whom you might intend to reach with this website. So um, colleagues, competitors, uh, you know, as I said, the, the search committee members or um, uh, in the case of find that blizzard, right? People who might be looking to buy merch so that you can fund, you know, your, your social media kind of public citizen science campaign. Um, so make an exhaustive list of everyone that you can imagine trying to reach with your website. And then this is the crucial part. <laughs> look at your list, maybe it has five, maybe it has 10 sort of categories and circle just one or two of them. And I think that's the hard part, but really focus on those one or two types of viewers and choose them as your main audience and assume everyone else is a supporting audience. And that matters because what the main audience members are trying to accomplish is what you're going to prioritize as you're designing um, or composing your content and designing the presentation of that content. Um, I can't remember, maybe it was Sylvia um, talking about Jessica Marie Johnson who observed that she had like a very strong sort of voice or sense of her personal brand. And I think that's really true. It's something that I really admire about, about Jessica. There's just like this deep sort of like sense of authenticity in every way that she shows up online, whether it's her website or whether it's her Twitter presence. If you're in the humanities, I totally recommend following her. She's great. Um, so I think it is worth thinking about what is your public persona? What is the personality that you want to um, give people access to in your web presence? So um, I, here is a sort of suggested way of thinking about it, right? Like identify the personality that you want to bring. I think another way of stating that could also be like identify the values that you want to embody in your in your personal website. Think about, and now I think is where you can flip it from what are your viewers trying to accomplish when they view your website and think about what are you trying to accomplish um, in creating your website. And then for both that personality or value that you're trying to convey and the goal that you're trying to accomplish, I think you can use those to sort of determine the do's and don'ts of your particular website. I took this, this matrix, I took this table from a colleague at 
Marquette University, who um, they actually have one of her colleagues in turn worked in marketing before becoming an academic librarian. And I think they, um, they developed this matrix together thinking the way a marketing professional would think about say developing a social media campaign or any sort of digital storytelling project like this this framework this matrix is definitely coming from the marketing profession but i think it's applicable to those of us who are marketing ourselves professionally um so <sighs> Just as an example, maybe one personality is that you're very polished and your goal is to cultivate a blog persona that is professional, in which case it would be super important for all of your content to be copy edited, if not formally peer reviewed, then informally reviewed by a friend or colleague um, you, you know, might use more formal language as opposed to informal language you would avoid you know this is about performing a particular kind of polish and expertise so things you wouldn't do would be to use colloquial language or upload um unedited content but i think you know this is this is not the only path to success right so let's say you're an SMFA graduate, right? I think it's really important to have your website sort of embody your, or, you know, to some extent represent your artistic practice. And in that case, you might be thinking about things like people observed about Kim's website, about um, the way she engages with the body and the gradient flesh tones in the background of her website. So finally, when it comes to content, um, I wanted to offer you a, another framework that I have found super, super helpful. Um, so this set of questions comes from an amazing couple of Twitter threads. I, I give a link on the next slide, but the, the person recommended crafting a personal mission statement. So knowing why you do the work and why it matters to you. And they weren't necessarily posing these questions in the context of writing website content, but I think it's super relevant because I think it it's part, you know, it informs the story that you want to tell about yourself. So questions that they recommend for crafting a mission statement include what motivates you in your academic work and life? Who do you want your work to be for? What communities do you most want to work with? I think that goes back to primary audiences of your website. What values that brought you to the profession have remained consistent? What values have risen to the fore? I think that question is related to the like personality or voice question that we talked about in the previous slide. Who are your professional role models? What do you admire about them and their work? P.S. Do they have websites that you can look at and see how they uh, present themselves online? And uh, a fourth question, you know, what legacy do you want to leave? So a very concrete example. So Gabriella Foreman is the person whose like Twitter conversations kind of resulted in this set of questions to ask. And her response to those sets of questions resulted in this personal mission statement. My professional mission statement is to create, sustain, be in, 
empower and recover collectives working not just for inclusion and equity, but justice. I seek to surround myself in and help create collaborative rather than competitive spaces. I seek to leave a legacy as an amplifier of my various communities, past and present talents, energies, and struggles for justice. Um, I think that a statement like this potentially could be the backbone of a, of a short bio or about me statement, whether it's the first thing that a viewer encounters on your website or whether it's, you know, tucked away in a menu item. Um, but I offer this to you as a way of thinking about how to compose a similar statement for yourself. Um, there are, you know, a couple of other things, right? Like you, depending, you might think about like, do I want to link to all my publications? Do I want to, do I have a portfolio? Am I selling merchandise, right? So there's lots of other questions related to content. Um, these, I think, are ones that I wanted to foreground and surface because they were not ones that I was thinking about when I was in grad school and about to go on the job market, but I think that they would have been transformative to me as I um, wrote content for my website. Okay. Planning website design. We've talked about the content. Now let's talk about the look and feel of a website and practicalities such as literally where, like what publishing platform. There are so many, and I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, um, but I'll draw your attention to a couple of them. So common platforms for building websites include WordPress. WordPress is the platform that I use to build my website. Um, it, this particular theme is called independent publisher. So it's a very text heavy website, but I really love the typography. I think it's very easy to read. It looks great on mobile devices as well as uh, large screens. WordPress, I think is one of the most commonly used publishing platforms. It's almost like, you may have heard the phrase WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. So you don't necessarily have to do under the hood HTML and CSS and PHP and JavaScript, right? It's more like working in Microsoft Office or something where you can highlight text and say, this is heading one, or this is bold, or this is a hyperlink. Um, so that's kind of on one end of the spectrum. I would put both Wix and Squarespace into similar categories. They're less WYSIWYG, which as I described is almost like working in Microsoft Word or something like that. And they're more like drag and drop, sort of visual building blocks. Um, so they're great for people who don't have a lot of experience in web design, nor <laughs> do they have any desire in gaining that experience. Um, I would say Squarespace is a little bit less customizable. Wix is more highly customizable. Both of them have premium options. I think a lesser known option that I'm a really big fan of is creating um, uh, a website using GitHub pages and Jekyll. That is actually what Thomas is doing with his website here. Um, so that's not to say that GitHub pages and Jekyll can only be text heavy websites. There are lots and lots and lots of options, but um, I think this option of GitHub pages and Jekyll might be more common in the 
natural sciences or like the quantitative social sciences where people are working a lot in GitHub for collaborative documentation or software development. Um, I think if that's an environment that you're comfortable with and familiar with, I would very much encourage you to check out a Jekyll website using GitHub pages. This is all a very personal choice. And if you want to, uh, if you want some more individualized coaching as you're making those choices, I would love to talk with you individually and help to sort of guide you through the process, which I felt my way forward <laughs> blindly um, myself. So I would love to be a, a guiding partner. Another strategy I would offer, I mean, probably none of us, right, at this point are coding our websites fully from scratch with all the angle brackets of HTML. Um, instead, what we're doing is choosing one of those platforms that I identified on the previous slide. And then within those platforms, there are a number of different templates that you can use for a website. So, before you go through the gallery of templates and get lost in the literal like thousands of options out there, what I encourage you to do is literally to sit down and sketch or outline your website. So for any of you in design professions, you know, engineering, you might be familiar with this concept of a wireframe or just kind of quick iteration in general. A wireframe, you see an example on the right side of my slide. It's a visual guide to the layout of a site. It focuses more on layout and structure, and it focuses less on the site's look and feel. So you might see colored placeholders for where particular types of visual content might go, but the purpose is to help you to try out a lot of different ideas, consider them, what works about them, what doesn't work about them, and iterate upon those ideas quickly without investing a lot of your time and money in fully building the site. This is a principle that people in you know, user experience design, web design use all the time, but I think that you can apply it to yourself as well. Um, a pencil and paper sketch is fine. Just use it to figure out what the important components are for your website. And then once you have those ideas in mind, use your sketches to evaluate the thousands of design templates that you might be browsing, whether it's in Squarespace or WordPress or Jekyll or Wix, use your sketches to evaluate whether those design templates are going to meet your needs. Um, I attempted here, I, I think I already spoke to, to much of this, but I attempted a sort of comparison of the features of Squarespace and Wix and WordPress and GitHub pages plus Jekyll. Um, is there anything I want to add? Cost is an important consideration, right? So Almost all of these options have a freemium model, meaning that uh, it could be free to you, provided that you use, you know, that you select one of a limited number of templates or that you don't um, upload a lot of media to the website. Um, GitHub Pages is entirely free and they're a huge number of Jekyll themes out there, although some of them, some of those themes are paid. The same with WordPress. WordPress, um, yeah, you can, some of the themes are, are for pay. I think uh, something I was thinking about as I was comparing these different platforms, like 
For me, in terms of my values, I prefer to have like a greater degree of control and ownership over my web content. So my preference swings in the direction of WordPress and GitHub, both of which are open source and which I can like kind of go under the hood and tinker more easily with. But you may place a high, um, it may be really important to you for it to be uh, easy and you might not desire as much control or customizability, in which case maybe Squarespace is a great choice for you. I think another kind of important decision point might be whether you're selling anything on your website. I, if you are, I think Squarespace or Wix might be the easiest ways to go. Um, I'm trying to imagine professions or disciplines in which um, selling might be part of what you're doing, maybe as an artist. Although, I mean, I was surprised in, in the science realm, right, to find, find that lizard and to see how, um, how that scientist was using merch to fund some of her public science initiatives. So, um, we are at our time. And so I leave you with, I guess, an exhortation or sort of a recommendation for how you might go about making your plan. Step one, I would spend some time finding examples of websites you like, all the better if they're made by people you like and admire. Um, step two, I would create a lot of different sketches of the kind of website you want to create so that you know what components are important to you. Step three, I would use those sketches to help guide your choice of a website platform as well as a specific design template within that platform. And step four, I would just urge you to have a lot of fun and enjoy creating your website. Um, okay, for real last words, I would love to kind of be a part of your professional website building journey. If you would like to meet one-on-one, -on -one, I'm available for a consultation. You can find me just by going to the Tisch Library website. You can search for me and directly from my staff profile, you can book an appointment. No need to ask me about my availability, just find a time that works for you. With that, I'll close. And uh, yeah, good luck. I look forward to seeing what you create. Also, we have a couple of more of questions if you have time. I definitely have time. Anyone who needs to go, by all means go. This web, the recording will continue. So if you want to um, find out the answers to questions later, you certainly can, or you can follow up with me individually but happy to answer the outstanding questions. Okay, so um, could you speak to how to go about choosing a domain name and extension, for example, mm -hmm. com versus org? Yeah, that's a really good question. So <clears throat> when, when you're choosing a domain name, most platforms are gonna give you a lot of options. .com is the most common, obviously. Uh, .org is kind of associated with companies or nonprofits. There are also like either industry specific or country specific. Um, so there's .us. Um, I think I don't I don't necessarily think there's a wrong answer. I I it kind of bugs me that I'm a .com. I'm a rarebit.com, but I don't I don't think that it makes a difference in terms of the ranking of your website and search results. Um, 
and .org doesn't feel quite right to me for a personal website. Now it might be different. So somebody, you know, critiqued the, um, I forget her name, but the, the scientist, the herpetologist, and they're like, this is a website for this one individual, but maybe it should kind of be a website for find that lizard, right? So I could imagine findthatlizard.org a little bit easier than I could imagine um, Thomas. I mean, obviously Thomas's website is thomaspadilla.org, but it, it doesn't feel quite right to me. I think .com is a good de facto choice and then you could explore other um, customizations. This was that was kind of a combined question from two that I received. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. if there's additional questions um, to sort of elaborate on that point, um, please just make a note in the chat or unmute yourself and, and uh, we can talk about it further. Uh, where are you buying your domain name through? Oh, that's a great question. I have super strong opinions about this one. Um, so my absolute favorite hosting platform, um, so I'm using WordPress and I am buying my domain name and my web storage from a company called Reclaim Hosting. Um, they, it, well, in short, it's a company that is specifically tailored for scholarly and creative users, um, so faculty and students, and um, it gives you full kind of under the hood access to cPanel. You can install lots of different web applications. So on my domain, rarebit.com, I have a WordPress installation. I also have a scalar instance, which is a kind of like a book publishing, multimodal book publishing platform. Um, so I really love Reclaim Hosting. That is sort of like leveling up perhaps from if you had a Wix or a Squarespace site. If you have a Wix or a Squarespace site, you can buy your domain name through that publishing provider. You can actually do the same thing with wordpress.com. I just prefer a higher degree of control. And so I use Reclaim Hosting to get both my web server space and to purchase my domain name. And then I installed WordPress and a couple of other apps on my web servers. Um, and Reclaim, they have like great customer service and they kind of know that their users are not necessarily, like they are committed to kind of helping you develop as, um, as someone with cPanel access, which is not necessarily like every academic, right? But yeah, I, I highly recommend Reclaim. Um, Chelsea, the other question, how do you go about choosing the name of the website? Mm. Another great choice. Um, Obviously I could have been chelsearowell.com, just like thomaspadilla.org um, or Kimberly Ferrero Arneas.com. Um, I was just sort of weirdly stubborn. Like what if I want to choose, like what if I have a different name in the future? Um, so I think, I think it's always a solid choice to make your name the domain, but there you could have many reasons for thinking that your name might not be your forever name, in which case you could try to select a domain name that's kind of related to your personal brand or your profession. Um, like I said, a rarebit.com is a sort of dumb library joke, but it 
delights me and it has become sort of part of my online identity. It's also my Twitter handle. Um, I think Yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that is just try to anchor the name in your identity somehow and in the identity that you're trying to convey to your specific audience. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Thank you all for joining us. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out to me individually. And if you do spend your copious amounts of free time during an intercession making a website, don't hesitate to share. I'd love to see what you create. Thank you, Chelsea. All right, take Bye, care. Everyone. Thank you, Chelsea. That was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you.